the core thing he began with in chapter one was this poem or hymn in verses 15 through 20 where he told the church that Christ is supreme. That Christ was the creator, he was the firstborn of creation, he's the firstborn among the dead, that he's supreme, that he's better and above all other things. That's kind of the big picture map that Paul paints. And then he places a you are here sticker on the map when he says that, that because of that, if we are in Christ, that we are then holy in God's sight. That we're without blemish or cause for accusation. That's something available to us now, not just after judgment in eternity, but now we are holy in God's sight without blemish or cause for accusation. Because we're in Christ and he's supreme, that's where we are. He then continues, he puts an X on the map of of where the treasure or the goal would be, of where we're supposed to get. And again, the answer is Jesus. That we would seek after Jesus, that we would run towards Jesus, then when we would get there, what we find is the treasure is Jesus, that he alone provides riches and treasures to us, that he's, he's the journey and the destination, that that's the core of what needs to happen. As he's saying that, he's doing so because the world around the church in Colossae is trying to tell it it needs more. It's trying to say, yeah, it's okay that you have Jesus, but alongside Jesus, you should add Greek philosophy and thought, or you should add uh, mysticism like astrology, or you should add the Jewish faith and the rules and regulations, that you should kind of pick Jesus as part of what you have, and then you should pick part of what the world is offering and part of what your job is offering and part of what other systems are offering, and you should kind of meld all of those together into what kind of life looks best for you. That's what culture is saying, but the leader of the church in Colossae, his name's Epaphras, has come to Paul and he said, I'm fearful that we would lose sight of what's most important and we would just start to become a mishmash of everything around us. Could you send a letter to the church to let us know what we would focus on? And that's what Paul's done. He said, Jesus is supreme, stay rooted in him. He's the full representation of the Godhead. He's the fully divine. And because of that, you are brought to fullness in him. You don't need to add anything to it. And when we were talking about that last week, I said the phrase, and I'll repeat it today probably a couple of times. If anybody is telling you that there's something you need to add to Jesus, you're getting a false gospel. We are brought to fullness in Christ and in Christ alone. We don't need to add anything to it. Uh, Paul then shifts in his letter, and we began this last week, uh, taking aim at some of the things people have said you need to add to Jesus. He began last week with the Jewish understanding of circumcision. The Jewish believers were saying, it's great that you believe Jesus is the Messiah. Now, if you really want to be in the people of God, you need to have that and go through the acts of the Abrahamic covenant with us. Go through physical circumcision. And Jesus has said, or Paul has said, no, no, you don't need that. Your baptism was a spiritual circumcision. Your flesh was spiritually cut off from yourself then. You don't need to do the physical act as well. It's not necessary. Jesus is enough. Today, he's going to take aim at something larger, and he's going to spend a lot more time talking about it. And that is, do you need to do all the behavioral management stuff? What about all the laws and rules and regulations? How much focus do we have to give those? If we don't need the Abrahamic covenant, what do, do we need the, the Mosaic one? What do we need to be the people of God? Paul's going to address that. Here's how he begins in verse 13 and 14. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. The Mosaic Covenant was this legal law-based system that God had given his people and it it showed them that there were certain behaviors that that caused a debt on your behalf. The debt was death. That was the punishment for the sins. Unless you had gone through these sacrificial practices, you were distant from God. And what Paul is saying is with Christ, as Christ is supreme above all things, that system no longer matters. Your legal debtedness isn't paid for in that system anymore. It's paid for by Christ who nailed your debt to the cross. 
It's all you need. You don't need anything else. He says it this way in verse 15. Having, talking about Jesus on the cross, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The Roman world was good at spectacle. When they would win a war, they would parade through the spoils of war, like the goods and treasures they had taken, followed by the captives of war, with the hopeful climax that in chains at the end would be the king of the nation they had just defeated. And as they would celebrate all of those things with songs and joyous triumphs and games of celebration, the hopeful climax of their celebration would be the death of that king. They would kill him as public spectacle. The assumption is is that as the Roman world was using the cross uh, to, to kill Jesus is that they were making a public spectacle of him. And yet what Paul says is just the opposite. That Jesus, having disarmed the powers and authorities, made public spectacle of them by triumphing over them by the cross. That he used the tool they had designed for him to be made spectacle. And he used it to show them who was really in control. He did that by resurrecting from the grave. That that power, that supreme Christ power, is what's available to us. And that when we have that, we don't need anything else, including lists of rules and regulations to focus on as we live our lives. Here's what he says. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Don't let people tell you that you're eating the wrong thing or touching the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. If the focus is on the list of rules and regulations, the focus is misplaced. That was a shadow. That was working for a season to give light uh, a representation of what was to come, but it wasn't the end goal. And if you've made it your end goal now, you've missed it. The end goal, the reality is Jesus. Above Sabbaths, above celebrations, above laws of diet, Jesus is what you need. And so don't let anyone put those other things in place in a way that start to disqualify you. You are qualified not through your righteous behavior. You are qualified through the righteousness of Christ. That alone is what you need. It continues in verse 18. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with no idle, with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They've lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Uh, let me paraphrase what Paul is saying there. He's saying, if you are in Christ and someone comes to you and says, man, I'm really glad you've given your life to Jesus. Uh, I've given my life to Jesus as well. But since then, I've had these other experiences. And I think you won't really fully be a Christian until you also have these other experiences. They're giving you a false gospel. They're trying to disqualify you until you have the same kinds of experiences that they've had. And what Paul says is that people who are doing those kinds of things, generally, they're arrogant, they have a false humility, they're trying to disqualify you, they're puffed up with idle notions and their mind is unspiritual. They've become focused on their experiences instead of on Jesus. And Jesus needs to be the focus, he's all we need. We're going to hear that all the time through this letter, Paul writes to the church. Instead, he says, because we've died with Christ, verse 20, since we've died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Why are you living like the regulations and the behavior management is what's most important? Why are you so focused on what, what you're supposed to do or not do. You've died to that, just like Christ was died, and you've been raised something new. You don't have to live that way anymore. Stop living in submission to that. You're part of a new creation. You're part of a new covenant. You're part of a new world. You don't have to live by those rules anymore. 
these rules, which have to do with the things that are destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. The, the rule system sounds good. It sounds black and white. It sounds clear. It's why when the people of God were, were given the law in the Old Testament, they rejoiced because they knew how to please God and they knew what they did that displeased God. And that would be fine if the focus was always on God. But the focus started to be on rules, not on God. And he says when that becomes our focus, when it just becomes about managing our behavior, we've missed it. It lacks any value. It creates false humility. It creates harsh treatment of your own bodies. It creates self-imposed worship. And it lacks the value in actually restraining the thing that needs to be corrected anyway. Now I see this play out in our own behaviors still. Whenever I meet with somebody about sin issues in their life and they need accountability and help with that, one of the things I try to always remember to say is we can put all the systems of managing behavior in place. I'll use uh, men and lust and pornography as an example. We can move the computer. We can put all of the accountability kinds of software. We can change the apps that are on your phone. We can put every system of accountability in place. And, And there's value in doing that when we're doing it well. But what's needed is a change of heart. And no system or rule or accountability can ever do that. Only Christ can do that. And so if all we're doing is starting to focus on systems and laws and rules and regulations, if we've turned our attention there, it lacks any real value in restraining the sensual indulgence. The only real value is a change of heart and that comes from Christ and Christ alone. We need not be focused on the earthly things, on the rules and regulations. We need just Jesus. And Paul expounds on that. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Stop worrying just about the rules and regulations. They're not what matters. They were a shadow of what was to come. Set your heart instead on Christ. He continues, verses 2 through 4. Set your mind... On things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Set your heart on Christ. Set your minds on Christ. Stop worrying about the earthly things. It's less clear. It's vague. It's even hard to manage and figure out what to do at times. Hidden and awaiting is hard to manage. Clear laws are easier to follow. The set your mind on Christ and your things above and recognize your life is hidden with him and will fully come when he fully comes. That's complicated. There's a now, Jesus and Paul have already talked about the things we get now. Now we are holy in his sight and we're without blemish or cause for accusation. But in not yet, your life is also hidden in Christ. And only fully comes to glory when he comes in his full glory. And in that, with hearts and minds focused on things above, where they should be instead of things on earth, there's an understanding of what will take place behaviorally. Not laws to manage and rules to follow, an understanding of what should take place as our hearts and minds are focused on Christ. Here's what would happen, it says. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Paul's going to end up giving us two lists. This is the first of them, and it's primarily sexual in nature. The second of them will be primarily speech in nature. And what he says first is, uh, you need to put this to death. Not you need to find some new rules and regulations and ways to manage it. 
There may be some accountability that's helpful. Find that. But don't find that as the end result. Find that as a, as a means of helping you put this to death. Which is something that only happens as Christ transforms us. So focus on him, not on the managing of earthly things. Put it to death, he says. And continues in verse 8 with the second list. But now... You must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language from your lips, and do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. The way we treat each other, the way we speak up to and about each other can't be filled with anger or rage or malice. We can't be slandering each other. We can't be using filthy language from our lips. And that's not just like a list of seven words that Hollywood has called swear words. No, just it, it, don't use any kind of ill language and don't lie to each other. The ways that we relate and speak and talk matter. And God says there's a version of them says it to us through Paul, that we need to rid ourselves of, that we need to put it to death. We need to be transformed because we're so focused on things above that these things are killed in us. Two lists. One about our sexual purity, one about our speech and relational purity. Simple question. How are you doing? Are these things put to death in your life? Are they forgotten and gotten rid of? Or do they still creep up at times? Maybe a broader question. How are we collectively as the people of God doing? And I don't just mean those of us in the room or now then Alliance Church. I mean the people of God corporately. How are we doing? Have we put to death things like sexual impurity and speech impurity? Would that be a notable, recognized statement that the world would look at the church and say, if they've got something figured out, it's how to be sexually pure and pure in speech? Statistics would show, and surveys would show, that's not what people would say. People would say that the church has taken clear stances on sexual things. The church has generally done a a good job of taking that seriously, but has done so with the whole list of second speech things. That as the church has taken sexual purity seriously, it's done so with anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language from its lips. Very few would say that what the church has done a good job of is figuring out how to rid itself of these kinds of things. Churches are splitting all the time because of these kinds of things. People are wounded by the church all the time because of these kinds of things. Now, Paul doesn't make this direct statement, but, but I'll make it because I think it's implied here. If a church or its people have made sexual sin and uh, known and taken strong stances against it and tried to put that to death the way it should. But its method has been with malice and anger and slander and filthy language. If we haven't also corrected the speech things, if we're, if we're taking sexual sin cur- seriously but still filling our sanctuaries and hallways and lobbies and cafes with gossip and slander and malice and division, we haven't pleased God. We've simply traded one kind of evil for another kind of evil. Paul says, these aren't things just to manage. You need to kill them. You need to put them to death. Jesus needs to do enough of a transforming work that these things cease to exist. And if they exist, you're not fully set on things above yet. You've just become managers of rules and laws and you've picked which ones feel convenient to you. 
Instead of, we have to take those things off, and he continues, and we need to put on a new self. As we would focus our hearts and minds on Jesus, we would put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. And here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. As we would put on our new selves, we wouldn't show up and and judge and divide. We wouldn't pick favorites, and we wouldn't have experiences or opinions that we think everybody needs to have to be in Christ. We would say, no, no, we don't need to divide. We can recognize truths. But Paul isn't saying there wasn't actually slaves or free there. There were both in the room. He's saying when we're together, that doesn't matter. What matters is that we're all in Christ and that Christ is in all of us. The list today might not be identical. It might be There's now no longer, when we're together, male or female, Democrat or Republican, old or young, contemporary worship preferers or traditional worship preferers. There's just all of us in Christ and Christ in all of us. Focused on things above, hearts and minds focused on Jesus together. And if it's become something different than that, if it's become just about managing behaviors and preferences and opinions, we've just traded one kind of evil for another. We've missed it. Instead, we need to be clothed in these new things. Here's what those new things are that we would be clothed in. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love which binds them together in perfect unity. It's a very different perspective. It would say, rid yourself of the things like sexual impurity. Rid yourselves of the things like slander and malice and anger and rage and filthy uh, language and, and lying. And instead, clothe yourselves with, and it lists the things, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness. It means when you see somebody and you have tension with them, you have disagreement with them, you have frustration with them, that you wouldn't run to your friends and talk about it to garner their support. You would run to that person and you would forgive them them. You would bear things with them. This is the new self that we would put on when we're focused on things above. But if we simply want to be focused on earthly things, we'll justify and defend and then use whatever feels fleshly and comfortable to us at the time. Instead, Paul says, bind all these virtues together with love and then live together with others in perfect unity. As we would do so then, this is what would happen. Verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. The division has never created peace. It's created comfort. It's helped us feel good about what we like and choose It's helped us feel welcomed by other people who agree with us, but it's never created peace. It's always created barriers between people and division. And Paul says, no, no, no. Focus on things above. Clothe yourselves with something new. Forgive others instead of slandering them. And then the peace of Christ will rule in your hearts. That's what we're called to, and we should be thankful that we get that. He continues about what would be true of us together. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. That when we would come together, that the things we would focus on would be the message of Christ dwelling among us richly. That that's what would happen. It would happen in the variety of different ways we interact but that what would be most clear is that the message of Christ dwells among us richly. Not that we agree on every way we have to interact to express that, just that the message of Christ would dwell among us richly. And that we would do that all with gratitude in our hearts for what Christ has done. And then verse 17 makes it a little more challenging. And whatever you do, together with us, individually on your own, whatever you're doing, whether words or deeds, 
whether the speech things or the action and rules kinds of things, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're saying, whatever actions you're taking, are you doing them under the label and name of Christ? Are you willing to be identified by that label with every word you speak and every action you take? If you're like me, at least times in my life, sadly the answer can be no. I have at times in my life evaluated in strange ways what would be appropriate to place on the back of my car. Did I want stickers or bumper stickers or the Christian fish symbol on the back of my car? And I can distinctly remember early in my faith driving my sports car and thinking, man, I really want people to know I'm a Christian, but I'm definitely not putting that on my car because I know the way I'm going to drive my car. And I don't want that, for people to see that and associate that with who I'm supposed to be as a Christian. I recognized that I wanted to pick and choose the behaviors I managed and labeled under Christ. And I wanted to be able to pick other ones and say, "Mm, I'm kind of just going to do those how I want. And I don't want people to have to know that I'm also a believer while I'm doing that thing. Because it might give Jesus a bad reputation, or it might give the church a bad reputation, or it might give me a bad reputation. Paul saying, If you've focused on these kinds of earthly things, if you are managing which deeds and words are the Christian ones that you say, and which deeds and words you won't put the name of Jesus on, then you've just traded one kind of evil for another, and you've missed it, and you're not really centered and focused on things above. You're just just managing earthly things. Paul says, don't do that. Whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. All of it should be done for Christ. As we read through texts like this, most of Colossians It's this really simple message. You just need Christ. You don't have to add anything to it. Focus on him with your hearts, your minds. Put everything in focus on who Jesus is and you don't need to add anything to it. Anybody that's telling you anything different is giving you a false gospel. And yet we also hear it and think, but how do I apply that? It's not nearly as clear as if you had given me the Old Testament covenant law which tells me exactly what I can do and what I can't do. How do I put this into practice? I want to offer a few suggestions from this week's text. Uh, Two things you can put into practice this week based on what Paul has instructed the Colossian church and through the inspiration of scripture us still today. Here's how it might apply and you might have to put it into practice. First, correct your sin issues. Identify from the lists in verses 5 through 9 of chapter 3, uh, mostly as it relates to sexual purity and speech, where you have sin issues and correct them. I want to be clear on what I mean by that. I don't mean manage them. There may be some wisdom and accountability you need to be put in place, but the correction of those issues is not a management issue, it's a heart issue. And that is fixed not through accountability, it's fixed through setting your heart and mind on Jesus and asking him to do a work that he alone can do. I also want to just extrapolate on this correct your sin issues. Uh, What I'm not saying is read through the list of sins again and then start judging a bunch of other people who have them. Somehow in our society, both of those lists, what we do with our bodies sexually and our minds in the same categories and how we interact with others, we've got really good at justifying our behaviors and judging everybody else's behaviors in those areas. We're never the gossip. We're the ones sharing the prayer requests so people can pray. And we're never the one that's sexually impure. We're the one that's 
purer than those around us and who has the right understandings of what that expression can and can't look like that we're confident somehow makes sense before God or that he'll forgive us for. Don't do that. Seek God's understanding of your sin issues and then correct them not by management alone but by allowing your heart to be changed by Christ which only happens as you set your mind on things above instead of just on earthly things. Second, and probably more clear and practical, and something for sure we can all put in place this week. Intentionally speak well. And Paul addressed a number of the ways that we would misuse our relationships and our words. The anger and the malice and the rage, the filthy language, the slander, Instead of participating in that way with your language, set your mind on things above. Set your mind and your hearts on Christ. And as you engage in every conversation you have, be willing to label it as one in the name of Jesus. Encourage people. Forgive people. Come alongside people. Bless people with your words. And if you hear a conversation starting to shift topic towards slander or gossip, remove yourself from it or redirect it. Don't just trade one kind of evil for another. And don't just manage earthly things. Focus on Jesus and then use, use your words to intentionally speak well. Everybody can do that this week. Spend at least a week. Start there. Spend a week not falling into the trap of letting your emotions and your desires rule. Instead, set yourself on and your mind on things and your hearts on things above, on Christ, and then use the words that would come from that and intentionally speak well. I want to pray that that would be true of each of us. Would you join me in that prayer? God, I'm thankful for the clarity of your word that Jesus is enough. And yet I recognize the temptation is to say, But things get black and white when we put rules and regulations and laws in place. And often it can feel comfortable to want to live in that kind of relationship with you and with those around us. And yet your word calls us to something better. Calls us to an understanding of that's just a shadow of what it looks like and that the best reality is not laws and rules and regulations and managing earthly things. The best reality is set on Christ. It's our hearts and our minds focused on him and a transformation that then comes in our life that only he can do by changing our hearts. And so we pray for that. We pray that then we would be able to to put our old self to death, that we'd be able to rid ourselves of the behaviors that came with it, and that we'd be able to clothe our new self in Christ with something new that comes again from Christ changing our hearts and from that alone. Root us in that, we pray, so that we could have peace so that we could feel confident as we engage with each other and so that whatever we do, words or deeds, we'd be happy to do them in representation of who you are. Help us to do that, we pray, asking it in Jesus' name. Amen.